May the Lord be on my lips and in my heart as I proclaim the gospel of Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. First off, a very hearty welcome to Bishop Yu for, for being with us and to his wife, Kathy. And we, of course, will have a reception afterwards, so please do join us and say uh, hello to your bishop and, uh, and greet him. So, this week, actually maybe it was last week, but recently, the last two weeks, there was uh, a little bit of a scandal, mini scandal in the Roman Catholic Church that erupted this way. Everybody knows that, like any institution, the Roman Catholic Church would run much more smoothly if there was no pope. Uh, people say the same thing about the White House. They would run much more smoothly if there was no president. People say the same thing, I think, about the Anglican Diocese of Toronto. It would run much more smoothly if there were no bishops. So here's how the pope got in trouble. <laughs> here's how the pope got in trouble. He was on the radio, and he said, he was talking about atheists, and he said, he gave a, a homily in which he said, the disciples, Pope Francis explained, were a little intolerant, closed off by the idea of possessing the truth, convinced that those who do not have the truth cannot do good. This is wrong. Jesus broadens the horizon, Pope Francis said. The root of possibility of doing good, that we all have, it's in our creation. Even them, everyone, they have a duty to do good, Pope Francis said on Vatican Radio. Just do good was his challenge, and we'll find a meeting place. And he goes further. The Lord created us in his image and likeness, and we are in the image of the Lord. And he does good, and all of us have this comm commandment at heart to do good and not do evil. All of us. But Father, this is not Catholic. He cannot do good. Yes, he can. The Lord has redeemed all of us, all of us with his blood of Christ. All of us, not just Catholics, everyone. Father, the atheists? Even the atheists, everyone. We must meet one another in doing good. But I don't believe, Father, I'm an atheist. But do good and we will meet one another there. The internet exploded. The Pope has said that atheists are saved. Needless to say, this went viral across the internet. And very quickly, the institution decided to uh, explain further the Pope's remarks. They said that, of course, he didn't really mean that all the atheists go to heaven. He just meant that people should do good and that we can find a common ground in the kind of common humanity and our kind of common desire to do good. They were clarifying his remarks. But I think this says something very important about the relationship between outsiders to a community and the insiders to the community. Because this pope is still very much an outsider to his community. He's saying things into that community which are an important testimony and witness that may be difficult for the powers that be to hear. This is a phenomenon that we see all the time. I mean, think about in business how people often hire consultants to say things that insiders have been saying for years. You know, they'll bring in a, a consultant to say something that some department manager has been preaching and trying to convince people for years about. But because the consultant is an outsider, and perhaps because he's paid a lot of money, or she, uh, their opinion is valued, while the insider's one is not. The stories that we have in the Bible today are similar. Stories of rejection of outsiders, who nonetheless have an important testimony to give. And by exploring them, we can engage in some of this question of the relationship between the prophetic outsider and the insiders that they harangue. Consider the story of Elijah. His basic point is that God is God. And in an era when there was another God, Baal, now, that word Baal actually is just a title that means Lord. In truth, there were a lot of Baals. There were different Baals depending on your local area and depending on what cause was close to your heart. There's a whole pantheon of Baals. This particular Baal, referred to here, was Hadad, was his name. And he was the god of fertility and the god also of rain. He was the bringer of rain. So there's this prophetic challenge. It's almost like you know, America's top model, except it's for prophets. And they go on the mountaintop, and they start doing this contest to see whose god was the real god. And of course, Elijah just kind of sits back, and he lets them try and try and try. And then he douses the, the uh, wood with water just to prove that there was no kind of shenanigans going on. There wasn't a smoldering ember in there or something. And God lights it ablaze. Interestingly, as an aside, Gregory of Nyssa uses this as an, as an example of the precursor of baptism that exists in the Old Testament. The, the three times of the water on the wood reminded him of the three times that candidates in his era were, were dunked into the water for baptism. So this outsider, Elijah, is speaking an unpopular word because these Baal gods were very popular. If you read the, uh, some of the stories of these gods, it, it reads like a soap opera. It reads a lot like the, uh, the, the stories of the Roman gods. You know, This one is the father of that one. They have a jealous feud over a mutual lover, and then you know, one builds a house for another, and then the other burns it down. It's all kinds of crazy stuff. They were popular, and Elijah was speaking an unpopular word, that they should not abandon the god of their fathers to follow this Phoenician god and gods but instead stay true to their Israeli heritage, their Jewish heritage. 
The story of Paul and the Galatians is kind of similar. Paul had founded this community, or at least been an early uh, benefactor of it. He had come and he preached the word, and then he goes away for a while, and then some other teachers come, and they start saying a more popular word than Paul's. They start telling people what they want to hear, which in this case seems to have been a message that the way forward in the faith is to uh, em embrace Jewish practices, is to become more Jewish. Now, this was mostly a Gentile audience, but for some reason, this was appealing, probably because people want things that they can do. So the idea of being able to do things to earn God's favor was a popular one. They could become circumcised, maybe that wasn't so popular, but they could follow the dietary laws, they could follow the purity laws, and, and so on. And so they started to drift away from his message of grace and salvation through forgiveness and so on. Begin to believe something about how they could earn their way into heaven. So Paul speaks a little harshly in his introduction to the Galatians uh, letter. He says that, uh, you know, I, I'm astonished that you're drifting away so quickly. Again, Paul the outsider with a prophetic testimony, uh, he gives it. And I don't know what impact this had on the Galatians. There is no second letter to the Galatians. But we can speculate a little bit. We can speculate. We can say that the mere fact that this letter is preserved meant that it resonated with the people to whom it was sent. Uh, I kind of wonder if there are some letters that didn't make it out because they were just crummy letters, right? But this letter was preserved because it was uh, a worthwhile testimony to the truth. And when they heard it, they recognized themselves in it. But my favorite story from this Sunday is definitely the one about the centurion. What a complex and beautiful story. Uh, it's complex for a lot of reasons. For one, who is the hero of the story? Or, or where is the focus of the story? Is it Jesus? Well, he doesn't have a whole lot of lines in this. Uh, is it the centurion? He actually doesn't have any speaking parts. Uh, it, what we get is, is what he said through his intermediaries. It's actually the crowd, it's the community around him that does all the talking. They're the ones that are really the focus of this. And this makes sense because you know, there's a really complex social environment happening here that has a lot of conflict in it. There's a complex web of relationships. This plea that he gives is, is mediated by a web of ethnic conflict, patronage, um, social capital. I mean, this is a guy who is representative of the occupying force of the Roman Empire. He is a centurion. He is a career military man. Uh, centurions had responsibility for around, I think it's around 80 soldiers. So you can imagine in our own context, this would be kind of like a, a senior sergeant in the military. Now imagine one of our senior sergeants over in Afghanistan living amongst the Afghanistani people and showing respect for their local religious practices, right, and giving money to build a mosque, right? That's how kind of transgressional this thing is. That's how kind of beyond the line what this guy is doing. But he's respected for it. He earns social capital. And so as a result of that, the local authorities are, want Jesus to do this favor for him. But nonetheless, there's this little bit of tension there. So of course, the centurion is very wise to use these intermediaries to go to Jesus and to plea. But what's shocking and interesting is that the centurion isn't looking for magic. What he's looking for is a cure. And he recognizes in Jesus something about who Jesus is, not just what he can do. I mean, look at it. He's saying this thing about his authority. He's recognizing the person of Jesus in a way that almost no one else does in the Bible. He says, you are a man set in authority as I am, and you have people under you as I do. And you say go, and they go, and come, and they come. And it is so with, with people, it is so with God. This is a startling confession of faith from a Gentile. This is a startling confession of faith from a man of violence, a, a representative of an oppressive regime. But beloved, in this we see something again important about the nature of the prophetic witness of the outsider of the community to the inside of the community. There's something about that outsider perspective that gives unique insight into the nature of a community. And this is where we come back to the bishop. The bishop is both a member of this community, and he's also a bit of an outsider. He's not here every Sunday. He knows many of us, but he doesn't know all of us. There are many here he probably doesn't know. And yet somehow that outsider perspective gives him a prophetic witness to this community. And that is part of the nature of how we do church as Anglicans. He is our consultant. He is the one that we bring from the outside to give us that perspective that we might not otherwise have upon ourselves. So now, as I usually do, I'm going to open this up for a few uh, comments and, and remarks people might have. Does anyone have anything they'd like to, to share in response to this?